2 Samuel 9, as we continue this Life Be Life in serial series, I'm going to read seven verses, uh, one through seven. Are you there? Say there. If not, then you'll have to catch up next week. And the Bible says, And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. On your way down, find somebody that looks better than you and just declare to them it's relocation season. season. Come on, come on, find somebody else. Say it like you believe it and receive it. It's relocation season. An unknown author coined the statement, man can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. While a hopeless life doesn't actually yield a physical death, in my opinion, it yields the death of purpose and the death of destiny. Without hope, we're nothing more than dead men walking, just existing, waiting to expire. And I've concluded that hope is rarely freely relinquished. An individual with no hope has usually been robbed of hope. An individual with no hope has usually misplaced it within the ups and downs of life. Many have lost hope for what can take place in the fourth or final quarter of 2024 because their hope was misplaced in the ups and downs of life in the first three quarters of 2024. Joblessness has robbed many of hope. Inflation has robbed many of hope. High mortgage rates and the decrease of home affordability has robbed many individuals and families of hope. The psychological effect of school shootings and no legislation changes has robbed many of hope. But despite the plethora of attacks in our daily life that have come to rob us of hope, I've come this morning to tell somebody that as long as we have King Jesus, guess what? We can still have hope. As long as we have the way maker, I can still have hope. As as long as I have the miracle worker faith, I can still have hope. As long as I have the promise keeper, I can still have hope. As long as I have the light in the middle of darkness, I can still have what? I can still have hope. Now, what is hope, Pastor? 
what we typically use or when we typically use the word hope in our general conversation, we align it with a wish, Angela. I hope the wait at the restaurant ain't going to be too long after church today. I, I hope it doesn't rain after I get my hair done. I used to laugh at that, but then now I understand what you, how you feel. Look at your neighbor and say, I understand how you feel. I hope the traffic on the way home from work it's not going to be crazy. I, I hope, not, not the link church, but a whole lot of people online, I, I hope I win the lottery this month. I know y'all ain't playing the lottery. That's for sinners. On the contrary, <laughs> biblical hope that is afforded to every believer could be defined as the eager anticipation for God to do what he said he would do. Let me read that again for the people in the balcony. What is our definition of biblical hope? It is the eager anticipation for God to do what he said he will do. Hope is knowing that if God did it before, he can do it again. Hope is knowing that God will never leave me or forsake me when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Hope is knowing that all things will work together for the good of them who love the Lord despite what it looks like. Hope is knowing that in the midst of life's storm, God remains steadfast as the anchor for our soul. Hope is knowing that despite our failures and shortcomings, God's grace is more than sufficient for our redemption. Hope is knowing that when we face uncertainties about the future, God already holds the master plan in his hands. So on this first Sunday of fall, y'all do to know, know that fall starts today, right? I want to introduce to some and, re and, and, and reacquaint to others a brother named Mephibosheth. Up to this point that we meet him in 2 Samuel chapter 9, Life has been a series of disasters, disappointments, and disruptions. With nothing for him to live for, he was a man that I would say was most miserable with no hope. Now, to truly understand his plight, you have to understand his story. And I believe that as we look at his story this morning, many of us will in some ways see a glimpse of ourselves. The first mention of Mephibosheth is in 2 Samuel chapter 4, and that's at the age of five years old. Now, before we even delve in who he is, I want to let you know what his name means. Mephibosheth means dispeller of shame. Could you imagine your name being me, meaning shame? It's almost as if he was born with the anticipation of living a shame-filled life. He was the grandson of the first king of Israel named Saul and the son of King David's best friend named Jonathan. Now, let's talk about, look, look at this history. King Saul, his, his grandfather, and his father, Jonathan, one day they're at war, and guess what? Both of them are killed in a battle. At that moment, his life begins to spiral out of control. Remember, he's five years old. So at five years old, part of the wealthiest family in the entire nation, and on the same day, his papa and his daddy dies in battle. The Bible lets us know that when the word gets back to him, that his nurse, the one who's taking care of him, she becomes afraid. So she picks him up and she's run, she runs, I guess, believing that everybody's coming back to kill everybody. And the Bible says that she drops. So while she's running to get away, she drops him, and then he injures his feet. And as a result, we find out in today's story that he became a cripple. To sum it all up, in one day, his papa dies, his daddy dies, and he loses his ability to walk and run. If that ain't life be life, and then I don't know what is. The first pit stop I want to make in this story is the condition. Somebody shout the condition. the condition. So we find out that Mephibosheth was dropped and it resulted in his lameness. Here's something that I thought was interesting is that he was crippled not because of his own missteps, but because of the missteps of somebody else. So he's now living this hopeless state. 
in a hopeless place, not because of something that he did, but because of something that somebody else did. I wonder how many of those in the room and those watching online are living today right now in this hopeless, lame state, not because of what you did, but because of what somebody else did. Stuck in life, feeling like you can't move forward because of what your ex did. Stuck in life, feeling like you can't move forward because of what your daddy did 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, because of what your mama did or because of what your mama didn't do. You are stuck in a place. You feel like you can't walk in purpose. You feel like you can't move in destiny. And it's not because of your mistake. It's not because of a wrong choice that you made. It's because of somebody else's mistake. This is what I believe that too many of us are so focused on whose fault it was that we ended up where we are that we didn't even have the energy or don't even have the energy or mental capacity to focus on how to relocate to a new place. You can tell neighbor and say, what are you focusing on right now? You focused on how he left? Focused on how she left? Focused on how they weren't present? Focus on how they didn't tell you you they loved you enough and you were beautiful enough and you were pretty enough? Or are you focusing on how can I move forward from this? How can I leave my place of insecurity? How can I leave my place of brokenness? Or are you only focused on the fact is that they broke me and it's their fault? They messed up, and that's why I'm here. That's why I'm struggling. That's why I'm on Section 8. Is it not a plan on how I can leave where I am and relocate, or am I focusing only on the fact that I was dropped, and I can't understand how nobody else is understanding that I was dropped? It's not my fault that I'm here. I got a question, though. If I run across my Mephibosheth in heaven, I got one question for him. This, this, is, this baffles me. I ain't read this nowhere. I ain't heard nobody else even preach this. But I got to ask him, how in the world did you become crippled because a, a lady dropped you? Five years old. You know, a five-year-old is about this tall. A five-year-old boy. Now, my boy, five years old, he was jumping off a couch his head first this high. <laughs> and the only thing he got to show for it is a couple of scars. But he can still walk. If you got a boy, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So tell me, how in the world did somebody probably your height, let's say she was even tall. Let's just say she was a giant. She was 6'4". He's, he's holding her this. She's holding him this high, a five-year-old. If she's holding him this high, what, is his legs this far off the ground? Maybe at most. I mean, I done jumped off of roofs when I was young. <laughs> Did it, did it hurt? Did I twist something? Yeah, but crippled for life? Mephibosheth said, how in the world did you get crippled and you was only dropped from about this high at five years old? You know what I was thinking? What if he wasn't crippled from the drop, but he was crippled because he never healed properly? What if it, he, he ended up as a lifelong cripple, not because the drop itself. Maybe the drop twisted his ankles. Maybe the drop broke both of his ankles, but because she went into hiding and she didn't get him the right uh, medical help or the right medical attention that maybe his bones grew back to a place to where he could never walk again. But it's hard for me to believe that he became a lifelong cripple because of the drop. And maybe it was just because he never healed properly. Are you where you are right now in a hopeless place in your relationship? Not because the way they left you, but because you never healed properly. <laughs> are you the way you are mentally, emotionally? Not because of the fact that you would drop. And we're not negating that. We, we never want to negate the fact that you were dropped. We know that you were dropped. You were mishandled. But are you still here only because you didn't get the necessary help that you needed to heal properly? I think for somebody in here, this is the end of your message right here. You don't even need nothing else. You just need to go figure out how to heal properly. 
Even if his ankles were broken, didn't heal correctly, you know what doctors can do? They can break them again and reset them right. And I think that's just the way some of us are. At this point, we just need to go somewhere where somebody professionally, if it's not God himself, somebody who he has anointed and gifted who can help break the places that were grown incorrectly so that you can walk upright again. The Bible says that they found out where he was as an adult. He settled in a place called Lodabar. That's important. Lodabar literally means no pasture and no word. We, we going back to a place of someone leaving where they should have been to go to a place where they've never been. A place of what? No pasture, no word. Scholars, if you read commentaries, agree that Lodabar was a depressing ghetto of sort. He moved to the projects. So somehow, after leaving the wealthiest house in the nation, he ends up in the projects. No chance of growth. No fruitfulness, a place of no hope, no life, no purpose. It was his lameness that led him to Lodabar. What happens with a bunch of us? We find places that cater to our brokenness. Instead of him saying, I come from a wealthy place. This ain't the place for me. He said, but because I'm broken. Because I'm crippled, because I lost daddy, because I lost papa, because of all the things that happened to me, the best place for me to be is a place with no life, no hope, no growth. Is that the reason you're where you are today right now? Emotionally, mentally, you've settled that this is the best place for a broken person. And I get it, sometimes when you feel so broken, you don't want to be around people that appear to be healthy because it makes you feel even worse about your situation. But look at somebody and say, the devil is a lie because this is relocation season. Here's your word. You don't have to settle in a place of no hope, no life, and no purpose. I can't control what will happen to me in 2024, but I can control how I handle the moment. And I want somebody to leave here today saying that regardless of how great the situation is or not so great the situation is, I'm going to choose to maximize the moment. The, one of the greatest sermons that was preached today was Bobby's worship. That was one of the greatest messages that was preached today, that regardless of how hopeless it seems, y'all, we prayed. We, we quoted the scriptures. We told God we know that you're a healer. We know that you can do it. And then yet God chose not to. But Bobby said, I'm going to maximize the moment. And Lady Dana, she said, she said Bethany already took uh, Bobby off the schedule, and I think she put candy on her. And I said, "Hold on, pause. Don't do that. Don't don't make any decision yet. Don't even reach out to him because." And I, and, and, and she, she'll tell you. She can confirm what I said. I said a a, a worshiper is going to want to worship through his pain. Yes, sir. <laughs> I said I I get it because when my my brother passed on a, what, a Friday, I didn't want to be nowhere else two days later but at church. I didn't want to be in my bed. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be nowhere else but in the presence of God in the sanctuary so that I could worship him and so I could just deliver. What, I just wanted to be where I knew God would be. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I said, don't, don't take him off the schedule. Let him tell us if that's what he wants to do. And she said, y'all talked to Bobby, and Bobby was like, I don't want to do nothing else on Sunday but worship God. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We have a choice. We can't choose the circumstance. Life is going to life, y'all. Storms are going to come. 
We gonna be dropped in some way, form, or fashion. Your boss is gonna drop you. A mentor is gonna drop you. Maybe a pastor will drop you. It won't even be personal, but the question is, how will you respond to it? Maybe somebody's watching online. I don't even know a pastor dropped you. Maybe it wasn't personal. But the way you responded to it was leaving a place of wealth to go to a place with no hope, a loader bar. You, you, you left a place of wealth. You left a place where you could worship. You left a place where God could speak to you in the midst of your situation and your pain. And, and you're out there now in loader bar wondering, what's next for me? The word for you is that you don't have to stay in Lodabar. It's relocation season. I, I got to move on. I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm, mo I'm moving. As we moved in 2 Samuel 9, it appears to be out of the blue that King David, King, David's a king now, he senses a need to find anybody who's left in Saul's house. Now, that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that a, a king rises up and he wants to find out, is there any a seed. Is there anybody who came out of the king's loin that's still around? It's, unco it's not uncommon for them to go look for them because what they need to do is kill them. <laughs> kill them because they may be the rightful heir to the throne and they can challenge the throne. They start a revolt, get a group together and come and kill. That's just the way it was back. That was a real, like Game of Thrones, that was some real Bible stuff back yeah. then, right? Yeah. But instead of him going and look for the seed so he can kill him, he's looking for the seed so that he can bless him. So he says, is there anybody left of Saul's house that he can be a blessing to them on behalf of Jonathan, who was at one time while he was alive, David's best friend? So my, pit, my second pit stop that I want to make in this story is the covenant. Somebody shout the covenant. the covenant. So the covenant, what is the covenant? It's a chosen relationship or partnership in which two parties make a binding promise to each other and work together to reach a common goal. So prior to Jonathan's death, Jonathan and David, they made a covenant with, with each other that they would be kind to each other's descendants. Maybe they knew, hey, if I die before you die, then I need you to watch out for me. So what he did, he basically became godfather, right? That's basically what he did. So in the sense, he was like, where my godson at? Do, is there, do I got any godchildren up in here, right? So they made a covenant that if something happened to me, I need you to make sure my kids are taken care of. Cool in the gang. If something happened to me, then I need you to make sure that my descendants and my kids are taken care of. So think about this. He's planning this. He's preparing for this. So while Mephibosheth was in a place of no hope, no life, no purpose, he didn't even know that a king was already making provisions for that his best days were to come. While he didn't even know, while he was sitting thinking, my life is over, this is my plot in life, I'm never going to get married again, I'm never going to find another wife, I'm never going to find another husband, I'm never going to find another church, I'm never going to become a homeowner, I'm never going to have kids, I'm never going to be anybody. Guess what? A king was making provisions so that his last days would be his best days. I just want somebody to know that you have a king in Jesus that has already made provision that your best days are ahead of you. The question is, do you believe it? And will you believe it? I wrote a couple of covenant promises. Listen, if you have no hope, the number one thing for you to do is go find out what does God say about my situation? Now, what does Luke Pastor Lewis say about my situation? Now, what does Lady Dana say about my situation? Now, what does the bishop on TV say about my situation? What does God say about my situation? I, I want to call those scriptures hope builders. I just wrote a couple of down, a couple down just to show you. Psalms 50 and 15. We got a whole book, y'all. This is life changing right here. Like, this will change the way you see yourself. This will change the way you see life. This will change the way you see people. This will change the way you see your circumstances. Psalms 15 and 15, I'm just giving you a couple. I didn't even get either AV, so you can write them down. This is just some general uh, covenant promises for believers. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. If you're in trouble right now, why wouldn't you be quoting that scripture every morning when you wake up? If you're in a place 
in any area of your life and you feel like there is nothing I can do to change this situation, you should be quoting nothing else but this. I shouldn't say nothing else, but this should be one of the main ones. And call upon me in a day of trouble. This is my hope builder. This is something that will make me get up out of the bed and say, you know what? Okay, cool. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to go to work because I believe that according to the scriptures, if I call on him when I'm in trouble, he will deliver me. That gives me hope. Why? Because what is hope again? Believing that God would do what he said he would do. So while I think life is over, I got a hope builder that tells me he will deliver me. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, here's just another one. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When, when, when would I quote that? When I just feel like I can't go on. When, when it's too, Bobby, when it feels like it's too heavy, I can't, the, the grief is too heavy, but yet I got a scripture that says that when I'm weak, his grace is going to strengthen me. His power is going to rise up in me, and I'll still be able to get up and move forward. This is just one of the thousands that are in here. Isaiah 40 and 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Let me stop right there. The only way you renew something is if it's been gone or canceled. Which means when I quote this, I'm in a place. Where I have lost all strength. I can't do nothing. I don't want to worship no more. I don't want to open my Bible no more. I don't want to go to church no more. But then I have a hope builder that said that if I hope in the Lord, he will renew my strength. And then they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. These are the promises. These are the hope builders that God has for the hopeless. So because of the covenant with Jonathan, I'm almost done, y'all. David calls for Mephibosheth to leave Lodabar. Leave the place of no hope. Leave the place of no purpose and no destiny and no word and no growth and move to Jerusalem, which means the city of peace. (laughs) My final pit stop that I want to make is the call. Somebody shout the call. When the king called, the Bible says he did what? He came. This is what I see here, that you don't have to be whole to come out. You just have to be willing to come out when you're called. His leg situation didn't, even though he was crippled, he still made it to the place that the king had called him out of. Come out of your hopelessness. Come out of your weakness. Come out of all of the mess that you put yourself in. Come out of the ghetto and come back to the castle. The call comes out. It involves at least two things. Write this down. The call comes out. Involved The call to come out involves two things. One, leaving what you've accepted as your lot in life. Leaving what you've accepted as your lot in life. Some of you have told yourself, this it. I'm going to die single. I'm going to die poor. I'm going to die broke. I'm going to die sick. I'm going to die alone. I'm going to die separated. I'm going to die without the vision that I had come in the past. But when God calls you out, you got to be willing to leave. Not just this physical place, but this mental place that you have created that says that this is all, this, this is it. Some of us, we feel like, you know what, I've, I've tried it a couple times. I don't want to try it again. What's the point? You ever felt like that, Marquisha's daughter? What's your daughter's name? Alexis. Have you ever felt like that, Alexis, where you like, I tried this before. I tried this guy thing before. Ain't no point in trying again. I've tried to leave Lodabar before. I've tried to leave the, the, the place of no purpose before. I've tried to, to leave the place of no growth before. I've put plans together, and none of it, it has worked any other time. What's the point in trying again? Mephibosheth took a chance on his life. Because I already know somebody said, man, be careful. You remember how your daddy, your granddaddy was treating David, you know, and, 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 we, and we know historically kings will come and they'll kill the seed just so you won't try to raise up. So maybe this is a trick, Mephibosheth. 
Maybe this is a trick. But I think Mephibosheth was at a place like, even if it is, <laughs> I ain't got nothing else to lose but try the king and see what he has for me. Because if anything else, I'm not going to die here. If anything, I'm going to die in the castle where he's called and tricked me to become. But I'm not going to die in Lodabar. We need some people who can wake up today, whether in here or online, and say, by any means necessary, I may die, but I'm not going to die in Lodabar. I may die, but I'm not going to die trying to get what I know I deserve. So you're going to have to leave what you've accepted as your lot in life. And number two, second thing we got to do when the call comes, embrace where you were always meant to be. All he did was go back to the place where he was born. <laughs> he was always meant to be there. Even though this detour of life be life and took him to another place, he was born to be in the presence of the king. All he did was go back home. <laughs> That's all he did. Listen, when you were born again, there are some things that became a rightful place for you. Whether you believe it or not, I don't care how long he was in Lodabar, there's no way he could forget. I was born in that castle. I, I, I was born in wealth. Now I'm going to get to go back to it. When you were born again, there are some things that were just for you. Love was for you. Joy was for you. Peace? Like, man, I ain't, ain't no way in the world I'm supposed to have peace with all this. I got all this stuff going on in my life. I ain't supposed to have that. Yes, you are. It comes with the Holy Ghost. That's all I was doing was giving you some fruits of the Holy Spirit. Those are some rightful places and some rightful benefits and blessings that every believer has the opportunity to receive. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness. These are just some of the things that are rightfully yours because you were born in it and you were born again. So God has some things for you. I believe that God is calling you today to relocate and come out. That's a challenge for somebody. God is challenging you to change your address from hopeless drive to hope drive. From peaceless drive to peace drive. <laughs> from lack drive to plenty drive. Can I give you one more verse before we get out of here? Look, look at, at verse 12, I didn't send this to, to, to A.V., but listen, listen to what verse 12 says. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. Hold on, you had a son. His legs didn't work. <laughs> but he, he in Lodabar he didn't have no kids it's something about leaving Lodabar and getting to Jerusalem that let him realize that there's some capability that I have that in Lodabar I never really despite the fact that he was dropped that didn't change. Despite the fact that he was crippled, that didn't change. But just because he was dropped and crippled, he still was able to produce something that was going to live long past beyond him. There's something on the inside of you that despite the fact that you were dropped and maybe you've been crippled in some area of your life, you can still produce something. Look at somebody and say, life is on the inside of you. All you got to do is get busy. <laughs> Stand to your feet and give God a praise right there. <laughs> One season, he was in a hopeless place. And then in the next season, he was in a city of peace. Making babies. <laughs> he changed his address. And changed his whole life. The Bible says that for the rest of his days, he ate at the king's table. 
know some of you are like, man, you know what? I get it. But I don't want to get too hyped about my situation changing and circumstances changing because, man, I just don't want to be let down. You know what I mentioned earlier that today was the first day of fall? What's the high today? Somebody got, a, got, got the temperature on their on phone? They can grab it real quick. Tell me what, what, the, what the high what the high is today. Huh? What's the high going to be today? 93. That's, that's summer weather. But regardless of how it feels, the season has still changed. Today is officially the first day of fall, regardless of what it feels like outside. But guess what? I'm going to start preparing for better weather. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start preparing. I'm going to make sure I get my jeans up because I wear shorts a lot during the week. I'm going to make sure I get my hoodies and stuff, get, get going, get them in the cleaners and get ready because I know the weather is about to change. How do you know that, Pastor? Because historically, every year at some point, the weather always catches up with the season. So even though it feels like one season, I know for a fact the season has changed. And I also know for a fact that at some point, I'm going to wake up and be like, man, it's chilly outside. That's what hope is. But it's not a wish. I got historical data that says that at some point, the weather's going to change and catch up with the season. And I believe that as you may look back over your life and be like, man, should I even try again? Should I even believe again? Should I even have hope again? We got historical data here, and we got historical data here that says that the weather will eventually catch up with the season. Do I have any witnesses that can say that I believed and God has showed up? Do I have any witnesses that can say that I prayed and God answered? Do I have any witnesses that can say that God has made a way out of no way? That God has delivered, that God has set free, that God has saved. When I believe God has come through, we have witnesses, we have historical data. Which means that it's okay for you to begin to prepare for the next season. Because I believe that the next season is here. Somebody shout, it's relocation season. I'm moving from a place of no word, no growth, no purpose, to a place of peace, purpose, wealth, and prosperity. In Jesus' name, heads bowed and eyes closed. God, we thank you for the challenge this morning for us to look deep into our life and examine the different areas of our life, God, where we have moved to Lodabar, where we have allowed... We have blocked the word from coming in. We have blocked growth from coming in. We have, we have settled there all because of us being dropped and us, us being mishandled and, and lied to and manipulated. All these areas, God, that we blocked and not allowed you to touch and heal and deliver. But today, we're relocating. We're moving our address and we're leaving this place of no growth and no purpose and no life and we're moving to Jerusalem, the place where peace is, the place where your presence is, God. And for some of us, it's just, it's a mental thing. For others, it is an actual physical thing. We need to leave some people. We need to leave relationships. We need to leave some jobs, some careers, some neighborhoods and maybe even some houses. And some of us need to leave a spiritual place and accept you as a personal Lord and Savior. But wherever we are today, is the day that we decided that we're going to relocate to receive everything that you have for us that is rightfully ours because we have been born again and we are now rightful sons of the king so we thank you for all the benefits and the blessings that come from that and we give you honor and glory in jesus name we pray amen now for some of you your relocation is spiritual so you got to accept christ this morning so when i count down from three we're going to ask you to come down and we're going to welcome you into the kingdom of God and we're going to pray for you. And if that's not you, maybe you say, hey, I've given my life to Christ before, but I walked away. My old church, we used to say, you backslid. <laughs> 
You used to pray. You used to come to church. You used to read your Bible. You used to give. You used to serve. But then life started life and you kind of walked away. You walked away from the church. You stopped praying. Stopped reading your Bible. You stopped doing all the things. All the things that you made a covenant with God about, you stopped because life was life. And well, I don't think that you're here by chance this morning, but this is God's divine plan for you to rededicate your life. So when we count down from three, God is calling you. The king is calling you to move out of that backslidden state, out of that rebellious state, out of that I left God state and come back home to your rightful place. So when we count down from three, if you want to rededicate your life, you can come down and we'll pray for you. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're saved doing a doggone thing, but you need a church home. Couldn't we use a few more people at the Link Church? Listen, we love to have you. I know it's a major step, but it was also a major step for Mr. Seth to leave Loader Bar and go and risk his whole life. But I believe you wouldn't be risking your life. I think you'd be gaining your life because there's a lot of people here that can love on you, comfort you, be a friend to you, be a sister and a brother to you, be mentors, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, everything you need. I believe that is right here at the Link Church. So when we count down from three, if you want to give your life to Christ for the first time, if you want to rededicate your life, or if you want to join the Link Church, now will be your time. Three, two, one, give God a crazy, ridiculous praise. Come on, if you're ready to move out of Lodabar, if you're ready to move out of the place in the state that you're in and you want to start a new chapter spiritually, now is your moment. Come on, I'm going to give you 30 more seconds. Give God a crazy praise for right there. Right there, right there, right there, right there. Listen, maybe you are watching online and you said, man, I know I need to come out of where I am and if I was there, I would have came down and gave my life to Christ. It's okay, wherever you are, God is present. He's right there as well. He's omnipresent. He's in your cubicle. He's in your home. He's in the living room. So you can accept him now with a sincere heart. Just repeat this prayer after me. God, I confess that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I believe that you came down from heaven and you put on sinful flesh and you walked this earth. I believe that you got on the cross with me on your mind. I believe that you went into the grave, but three days later, you got up with all power in your hands. I invite you into my life to be my savior and to be my Lord. Fill me with the gift of the Holy Ghost and never let me be the same in Jesus' name. Listen, if you said that prayer online, just text the keyword to that number on the screen and we'll connect with you. Or if maybe you said that prayer in your seat but you didn't come down, we would love to know that you rededicated your life to Christ. So just go to the next steps table area or area rather, not table, and say, hey, I gave my life to Christ today. I rededicated my life and I want to know what my next steps are because we believe that salvation is not the end of the story but it's the beginning of the story. We're going to dismiss and I believe and I'm praying that you guys are going to have an amazing week but if you guys want to have some one-on-one -on -one prayer the altar is going to be open so you can feel free to come down and get prayer other than that we'll see you merry life and living single this wednesday last time on zoom and next month we'll be back in person god bless you we love you we'll see you soon